Hello, everyone. Welcome back to RQS Summer School. There we have the second session, still from second session of the river Sunday mornings from Professor Mark Sathman. Start talking about root bird interactions. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll finish up part one on river interactions and then we'll get on to part two. So even if you're not an atomic physics aficionado, you'll probably find this next uh, presentation more interesting. So let's just dive a little bit though into the details of how this Rydberg interaction works. And sort of the basic notion is what we call a Furster resonance. Uh, Mr. Furster looked at uh, a long time ago, looked at the um, interaction of molecules. And so the mechanism he identified is now called the Furster interaction or Furster resonance. And it lies at the heart of the Rydberg Rydberg interaction. When we excite an atom to a Rydberg state, a particular electronic orbital, we're exciting a state of definite parity. So S parity or P parity or D or whatever. And those states of definite parity have no permanent dipole moment. There's no permanent dipole. What there is, is a transition dipole. And the idea is shown here. Supposing I have two nearby atoms, each excited to this NS level. There's a resonant interaction where those atoms, oops, can hop back and forth between those two levels in a resonant way. But the energy spacing here to here is the same as the energy spacing there to there, then I get a resonant interaction. So there's still no permanent dipole, but there's an oscillating dipole. And so I get an effective dipole-dipole interaction between those two oscillating or transition dipoles, whatever you want to call them. And that leads to an interaction strength which at short range uh, scales as one over R cubed, where R is the separation of the atoms, and the long range takes on a kind of universal van der Waals form of one over R to the six. Okay? And there's a, there's a crossover distance where you effectively transition from this one over R cubed to one over R to the six behavior. <clears throat> Why does that happen? Well, it, it happens because it, the interaction is resonant if that spacing is the same as that lower spacing, but in fact, those spacings are not identical. Uh, the energy separation of atomic levels, just the, the Bohr energies go as one over n squared, and so the separation between neighboring levels at high n goes as one over n cubed, and so it depends on n. So those two spacings are not the same, plus any atom that's not hydrogen as a quantum defect. So there's some additional uh, atomic physics to do with the interaction of that Rydberg electron with the core of the atom, which uh, additionally changes the separation of the levels. And so it becomes a bit more complicated, but we can work through a toy calculation. And this is the, probably the most detailed calculation in this presentation, but let me just sketch for you what, how one does this. Supposing I want to calculate the interaction strength between those two atoms. Well, let me just look at this without considering fine structure. So I have an S orbital, so there's just one state there, and then that can couple resonantly to P orbitals, uh, allowing for dipole selection rules that, that couple S to P, and the P orbital, that's angular momentum one, has substates with angular momentum projection, one, zero, and minus one. And if I consider symmetrized states, if I have two atoms, and I excite them um, symmetrically with a laser beam that couples to both atoms symmetrically, then I can reduce my total basis to just four symmetrized states, both atoms in the S state and both atoms in uh, one of the atoms in the upper P state and one of the atoms in the lower P state or vice versa. And it turns out that if I consider the interaction in a, with a quantization axis along the molecular axis, along the line connecting the atoms, the projection of the angular momenta is conserved. And so that limits this interaction to just four symmetrized states. So then I can write down the Hamiltonian for that four by four problem. I assign the NS, NS energy to zero and the energies of the other states are, have a 
a difference delta, where delta is this energy defect or first or defect, which is the difference in energy of an atom here, an atom here, and my two initial states, uh, the MS states. So that's my energy defect delta on the diagonal. And then I have um, the interaction matrix between those states, which is just the matrix elements of this dipole-dipole operator written here in a, in a spherical tensor basis. And so um, then I just uh, solve that Hamiltonian. And what you find is energy eigenvalues of this form that scale as the energy defect plus minus the square root of the square of the defect and the square of this uh, U factor, which is just the product of the matrix elements connecting those S and P states. And so there's two limits. Supposing this energy defect is large. So either the defect is large or the, the interaction U is small because I I'm, I'm, have a very large separation. Then if I expand the square root, I get a energy interaction energy that scales as this uh, U squared divided by the defect. And that becomes, so there's a one over R cubed here, but it gets squared. So it's a one over R to the six van der Waals interaction. And one writes that as a C6 coefficient divided by R to the six, and that scales as N to the 11th. In the other limit where the defect, sorry, so there's one more bit here, turns out for rubidium and cesium, the difference in the um, uh, energy defects uh, of the S and P states is a half, and you don't get a one over and Q behavior or the defect get a one over N to the fourth. So we actually get an N to the 12th scaling. In the other limit where the defect is small or the interaction is large because the atoms are very close together, then I expand the square root with the defect being small and I get an energy that scales just as this U factor. So it's one over R cubed. And then it's the product of these matrix elements. Each matrix element is an N squared. So I get an N to the four scaling. And that's effectively isotropic, at least for S states. So, so I'm gonna skip this with all these channels. So one has um, uh, this kind of scaling of one over R cubed at short range, one over R to the six at the long range. There's a complication that can occur that um, we discovered a long time ago which is there are particular Rydberg states that don't have any interaction. And so we call these first or zero states. And it's kind of like um, dark state physics in, in standard atomic physics that there are superpositions of ground angular momentum states that don't couple to laser fields with particular polarizations. There are linear combinations of these Rydberg states with different angular momenta um, projections that don't have interactions with each other. And so they, the river blockade can fail in that situation. And that happens when the number of angular momentum states available in the target states is smaller than or equal to the number of angular momentum states that you start with, then there are superpositions that have zero coupling. And so I probably don't wanna go through the details of this, but you can see it here in this uh, numerical plot where I'm plotting the, um, molecular energies of different angular momentum substates uh, of the Rydberg interaction. And you notice some of these curves are flat. That means there is no Rydberg-Rydberg interaction. And so this happens if I choose, for example, not to excite an S state, but here I'm exciting D states that couple to P and F states, one less and one larger angular momentum. And some of these states have um, have zero eigenvalues, have, have no Rydberg coupling. And that can be a problem uh, if you try and do Rydberg physics in large ensembles where you can excite different states uh, with different orientations relative to each other that you run into these zeros. And so that can be a problem if you're trying to do uh, blockade physics with single excitations in large ensembles. I'm sorry, there's probably not time to really fully explain this but the details are in these, in these papers. Um, it's also interesting to look at the angular structure. While S states are relatively isotropic, here's the interaction strength of S states in green, and you see they're flat as a function of the relative angle 
of the um, two atoms relative to a fixed quantization axis. And then this blue curve is the angular structure for, for a D state. And you can see it's got a very strong um, angular dependence. It's got, a, it's got a strong interaction because the, this particular state, 43D in rubidium, has a very small defect just because of the way that the quantum defects work out. So you get a very strong interaction. To get an equivalent isotropic interaction, I have to go to a higher end here, uh, 55S. So, so there's details there. And this angular dependence of the interaction can actually be a problem in ensembles. It's also a resource that one can take advantage of uh, when designing, for example, multi-qubit gates, where you might want some of the atoms to interact strongly and others not to interact strongly. Um, so this is sort of in a, a different example showing a similar behavior where we, you can have, by choosing different states, you can get large uh, state dependent variations in the interaction. So here I have a strong S to S interaction, <clears throat> a strong P to P interaction, but a relatively weak, uh, sorry, a strong S to S and a strong S to P but a, but a much weaker here at certain angles, uh, P to P interaction. And again, this, this type of behavior is something we looked at when designing um, multi-qubit gates some time ago. That discussion about first or zero states and uh, angular interactions is based on the approximation that one pair of Rydberg states couples to one other pair of levels with this first or mechanism. Reality is more complicated because if you go to high end excitation, there's a lot of different Rydberg levels there. So here's just one example looking around N equals 60 P in rubidium. There's a whole bunch of other combinations of states that are within a couple of gigahertz of each other. So in principle, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of different atomic states and this sort of single channel model is no longer a good approximation. Um, there's a limit to how many states one has to consider because the matrix elements between uh, different Rydberg states tend to be concentrated around just a couple variation of the principal quantum number. So if I ex have an atom excited to principal quantum number N, I can ask how large is the matrix element N prime? And for high N, all of the um, oscillator strength is um, concentrated in just a couple levels. So I, I don't have to consider all of these states, but I'm going to have to consider more than one in general if I want an accurate calculation. And if you consider atoms very close together, well, you get into spaghetti physics. So here's a numerical calculation from Jim Schaeffer's group looking at cesium. So this is pretty high up around um, close to n equals 90, uh, looking at the energy of the different molecular states as it's, it's a function of the interatomic spacing. And down here around three or four microns, it's a mess. You know, there's just a huge number of states here. So I'll just say in practice, when we're calculating Rydberg interaction strengths and designing gates and designing experiments, uh, although you can do things analytically, if you consider a single channel in practice, we just do it numerically. And um, these days there are open source numerical codes available. There's two good codes that have been uh, put out there. This pair interaction code is from Stuttgart, and there's also a code from Durham, not Durham, North Carolina, but Durham, England, from Charles Adams' this group, uh, which is also available uh, on the web. So you can just you know, grab those codes, and they have friendly interfaces and so on, and calculate sort of everything you want to calculate numerically, including Stark effects and Zeeman effects and, and so on. Okay. That was Rydberg interactions, and I'll give you this further reading thing later on. I need to change to part two now. Let's see if I can do that. Part two. Is that still working? Great. Okay. So now we're going to turn to quantum simulation and computation, and I kind of want to cover four topics. Different regimes of interaction. I'm going to talk a little bit about RQS, Rydberg Quantum Simulators. Um, and then I'll talk about, I'm not going to say much about that, mainly because I don't personally work with the simulator experiments, the analog simulators. 
Then I'll talk about Ripper Gates and uh, talk about the recent work with digital quantum computers with Ripper Gates. Okay, so here's the actual calculated interaction strength as a function of distance uh, for some S states of cesium. And so I mentioned this uh, 12 orders of magnitude ratio. It depends on the separation. The, the ground state interaction is dominated by the magnetostatic dipole-dipole of the, of the electrons, and it's a very weak one over R cubed. So it subhertz at a few micron separation here. And then depending how high in principal quantum number I go, I get a larger um, Rydberg, Rydberg interaction. This change in slope is that transition from the one over R cubed to one over R six behavior I just mentioned. And that transition pushes out to further R as I go higher and then and the defects become smaller and the dipole-dipole interaction range gets longer. So at n equals 100, this transition is here, seven, eight microns, at n equals 50, it, it's at a much shorter distance. And you know this gives the uh, perspective of having fully connected uh, many qubits. If you think about a 2D array of atoms, uh, if I space them by two and a half microns, and we're indeed doing experiments at about three micron spacing now, if I'm out here at um, n equals 100, you know, I could think about having 60 fully connected, which, which you know, is interesting and hard to do in, in many systems. Okay. There's really different regimes once you think about with Ritter blockade. And I realize now I forgot to include like some of the original blockade work, and I forgot to include even a slide showing what blockade is, but it's simply the notion that if I excite one atom to a Rydberg level, if I then try and excite a second atom to that same energy level, it gets blocked because two excited atoms have a shifted energy, these molecular curves, and so that second excitation will not happen. That's an easy way to think about it if you think about it in terms of sequential excitation, you can also think about it in terms of simultaneous excitation of an array of atoms with a big beam with a Rabi ray going from the ground to the Rydberg state of omega. And there will be a blockade distance. And it's important to emphasize that the blockade distance is not an atomic parameter alone. People say, well, what's the blockade distance of your atom? The blockade distance is a parameter that depends on how strong the atoms interact, the C6 coefficient, and also, I'm gonna run out of power, I need to grab my charger here. And it also depends on how strong you're driving them on the raw here. So the blockade distance is the ratio of the C6 to the uh, raw rate to the one six power. Sorry. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. Great. Okay. So one regime is that of weak interaction. Supposing the blockade distance is small compared to the spacing of atoms in the array. That means I have, I have just weak interactions, and so I can simultaneously excite all the atoms. Well, that's quite interesting for, for sensors and really is the regime that simulators work in, where I'm exciting multiple Rydberg atoms at a time and using their interactions while they're both excited to, to implement um, some quantum simulation. Uh, it's also useful for sensors. There's a whole field of work going on these days where people are using Rydberg atoms to detect um, RF fields over very wide frequency ranges uh, uh, for sensing. Then there's an intermediate regime where the blockade distance is comparable to the lattice spacing. And in that regime, if I excite a whole bunch of atoms at once, the spatial distribution of excitations will tend to self-organize itself to minimize the, the excitation energy required and so one naturally gets spatial correlations occurring. And this was shown uh, really nicely by an experiment in Munich from the Block Group, where they showed these uh, patterns with, with symmetry occurring in, in this kind of regime. And then finally, there's the, the limit of strong interactions where the blockade 
uh, length is large compared to the lattice spacing, and so I can only excite one atom at a time. Yes? I'm sorry to come back to this, but I'm just wondering in this picture where um, the opaque radius comes from the fact that the bases of the tune are of resonance because of the interactions. Yeah. Why, why does the base of the not take longer than? Uh, Mark, you also just repeat the question. Sorry, the question was um, in the expression for the Rydberg blockade lens, C6 over omega to the 1, 6, why does the laser line width not come into this formula? Yes. So I'm using omega here as the relevant um, rate associated with the laser. There's also a laser line width, but um, for the experiments I'm considering, the Rabi rate omega is always very large compared to the laser line width. So it, so it dominates. If I had a very low Robbie rate, I'd care about the laser line width. So it's basically tall broadening which dominates. Yes, yeah. That's right, so let me, you know, I forgot to include this slide, but let me just draw it here. So this is R. There's a, there's a molecular curve, which long distance goes as one of R to the six. If I excite one atom, there, that's the energy there, okay? I can excite another atom over here to that same energy. But if I am trying to excite another atom here, and this is the, the line width or the power broadened Rabi rate, it'll be off resonance. Sorry, I try and excite it to that same energy. There, there's no state there, okay? That's blockade. So in the strong interaction limit, I excite one atom, but I don't know which one. And in general, I get a coherent superposition of, of all of a single excitation uh, shared among all n atoms in the ensemble. Okay. So Ritter quantum simulators, let me take a couple of minutes to talk about them. And it's really a comparison between analog simulation and, and digital gate model circuits. So analog simulators have been worked up on with Rydberg atoms have been demonstrated by a number of groups and the most impressive and really uh, beautiful results have come out of the, the Harvard group and, and the French group of Roe's. And these analog simulators, um, have simplified control compared to doing digital gates with Rydberg atoms. They're partially programmable. They don't really have error correction, but they're, they're somewhat easier to work with and also very powerful. The digital gate model circuit approach, we have full quantum state control. It's universally programmable. There's a difficult but um, uh, well-defined path, we believe, to error correction. And so these are really complementary, these two approaches. So let me say a few words about the analog simulators. So the physics of Rydberg interactions can be mapped in a very natural way onto a quantum icing model. So consider a, a atom in the ground state that's coupled to a Rydberg level with some detuning delta and some Rabi rate omega. And I'm not assuming blockade, I'm assuming I can just excite more than one atom. And if I, N here is the um, population of atom, N sub I is the population of atom I in the Rydberg state. And if I simultaneously excite two atoms, well, they exist on this molecular curve and they have some energy of interaction. So I get, depending where the atoms are, how far apart they are, what Rydberg levels I'm using, I get some interaction energy UIJ. So there, there's a term here, which is just the Rydberg interaction. This, if I think of my uh, two level system, my qubit, if you will, as being a combination of the ground state and the Rydberg state, then this excitation laser gives me a sigma X operation. I'm just rotating between the ground and the Rydberg states uh, with a, a rate omega. So that's my Rabi drive. And then if I choose a detuning delta, that corresponds to, to an additional um, phase that I put on, on uh, atom I if it's excited, okay? So these are the three components of my Rydberg Hamiltonian, and that implements an icing model. An icing model computationally is, is interesting, and it was shown a long time ago that the non-planar icing model 
and the icing model with transverse field and long range coupling are NP complete problems. So there are hard computational problems that the quantum icing model, which the Rydberg atoms naturally map onto, uh, allow you to, to tackle. So, so Rydberg analog simulators may be able to tackle hard problems. That said, there's some open questions. You know, to what extent is this programmable? It's programmable in this way. It's not universally programmable in the way that a digital quantum circuit is. You know, how long a simulation are we going to be able to run? These Rydberg states don't have the same coherence properties as the ground states. The ground states can have you know, seconds of coherence. This has been shown. Um, I didn't show you a slide with Rydberg lifetimes, but if I go up to n equals 100, I get several hundred microseconds of Rydberg lifetime. So the coherence time here is it's going to be not more than hundreds of microseconds. And so you have to scale that to how fast I'm, I'm driving this thing as to how deep a calculation one can run. And then, you know, this is sort of a broader question, not limited to the Rydberg implementation, but, you know, the question that I think your center also is, is going to be thinking about is to what extent can, you know, analog simulators be error corrected and be reliable? This is, this is an important open question in the field. Um, Nonetheless, there's been a lot of interesting recent work, you know, starting with sort of problems in physics, studying this kind of model in large arrays with 200, 250 atoms, looking at um, quantum magnetism and phase transitions um, in these systems. And I forgot the citation here, but there's a recent paper from the Lucan group showing that they can also use this type of Hamiltonian for solving graph optimization problems. So they looked in particular at the maximum independent set problem and found some instances where um, the, the Rydberg solution gave a speed up, other instances, maybe classical methods were better. And so, you know, there's still work to be done, but there's, there's interesting applications of these, these uh, quantum simulators. And indeed, a couple of the, the uh, neutral atom startup companies are building analog simulators to, to tackle uh, different problems. Um, there's also, you know, plenty of ideas out there that have not yet been realized, and I'll just mention two of them here. Here's a, a paper from a decade ago, by layers of Rydberg atoms as a quantum simulator for unconventional superconductors. A lot of fancy words in there. Um, and here they're considering two layers of Rydberg atoms where uh, one layer has well-localized atoms, uh, deep wells, this is their phonon layer, and then they have a layer with shallower wells, but they also have transport going on, and they call that an itinerant layer. So this is a, could be used to model um, unconventional superconductors. Uh, here's a paper from the Zoller group uh, looking at quantum spin ice and dimer models with Rydberg atoms. And if you dig into the details of this long paper, you'll find a lot of um, interesting ideas that take advantage of some of this um, uh, different angular momentum states of Rydberg atoms and ideas for engineering interactions that vary as a function of orientation, vary as a function of distance in more complicated ways than what I showed you. And so, you know, there's really a rich uh, playground here for exploring uh, how to implement different models. So beautiful work that's already been done. Um, looking at phase transitions and magnetism, but I think we're gonna see a lot of different um, uh, directions in the next couple of years, uh, taking advantage of some of the more degrees of freedom of these Rydberg states. Uh -huh. How can you change the kind of interaction? Because right now it's, at least from my understanding, it's a ZZ interaction, but how would you switch it to like a you know, sigma Z, sigma X, or sigma X, sigma X? Yeah. What are kind of the control knobs you have? Sure, so you can, a couple different things, you can, have more than one laser and excite um, multiple Rydberg states. So supposing I excite not all atoms to the same state, but excite some of the atoms to an S state and some of the atoms to, the, to a P state. Then I get an interaction where those states um, get exchanged. And so I've, I've expanded my basis. So I, so I have a richer uh, you know, Hamiltonian space and I can get some additional dynamics. You can also invoke multiple ground states with one or more Rydberg states and also consider what's going on, even though I'm using 
multiple Rydberg excitations to get this interaction, not just blockade, but I can also decide which ground states I want to excite from. And so people have actually shown on paper that you could implement uh, Heisenberg interactions if you wanted to, or anisotropic Heisenberg interactions, not just the icing interaction using these additional degrees of freedom. And I forgot to repeat the question, which was how you implement these more um, uh, complicated uh, interaction models, not just the icing model. Okay, so I'm not gonna say a lot about simulators. That's what I wanted to say. I'm gonna go back to the sort of pairwise interaction of Rydberg gates. And there's a lot of different ideas out there now. There's, there's uh, a large literature that's emerged about um, how to design and implement uh, Rydberg entangling gates, you know, starting with the original blockade gate from 20 years ago, but you can think about simultaneous interaction of atoms and use their interaction energy to create entanglement. There's dressing methods, there's adiabatic gates, there's dissipative gates, gates between different elements, um, hybrid gates with Rydberg coupling to other systems, multi-qubit gates, and also now gates for molecules and even trapped ions have been demonstrated. So there, there's a lot of work that's been done using Rydberg interactions to prepare entanglement. And one can ask a lot of questions. You know, what kind of gate is it? What's the fidelity? How fast is it? Is it robust to experimental parameters? What's the Doppler sensitivity? What's the range and so on? Um, so lots of different aspects there. I'm just gonna focus on a couple of these gates. And let's start with the original blockade gate, how that works. So this is the proposal from uh, 2000. And the idea is this three pulse sequence. So I have my two uh, qubits, control and target. And here I'm showing them as hyperfine qubits. And I'm gonna couple one of those hyperfine states to a Rydberg state and assume the hyperfine splitting is large enough that this zero state, an atom in the zero state is just dark with respect to that laser light. So I do a pi pulse control to Rydberg. I do a two pi on the target up and back down and then another pi pulse. And in the ideal limit where the um, interaction strength that I like to call B for blockade and the hyperfine frequency omega Q are large compared to the Rabi rate, which is in turn large compared to the spontaneous decay rate from the Rydberg state. In that ideal limit, I get a CZ interaction. And basically, just to walk through it, if both atoms are in the zero state, they're dark, nothing happens. I get a one for the interaction matrix. If the control atom or the target atom is in the coupled state, well, it goes up and down. Uh, the control atom goes up and down because of those two pulses. The target goes up and down because of the two pi pulse. And I get a minus one because I did a two pi rotation. And there's no interaction so far. And then in the, the interesting case is when both, both atoms start in the one state, the first one goes up. The second one doesn't go up because the blockade shift moves me out of range of the Rabi rate. So it stays down here. And then the first atom comes back down. So I just get a minus one there and that's a controlled phase gate. Okay, so that's the basic blockade idea. And you can ask, well, how well will that work? And you can do a careful calculation, but you can also make an estimate on the back of an envelope. There's a blockade error because the blockade shift is not infinitely large compared to the Rabi rate. And so even when uh, the first atom is excited, the second atom will get some partial excitation. That error scales as the blockade over the Rabi rate squared. And then there's a spontaneous emission error because I have to spend some time in the Rydberg state. And that scales as the time I spend in the Rydberg state, which is one over the Rabi rate divided by the Rydberg lifetime tau. And then you can choose omega to minimize the sum of those errors and you get this expression here, okay? And then you can look at what that implies for the gate fidelity. And what you find is up to some numerical factors the gate fidelity scales as one over the product of the um, uh, interaction strength B times the Rydberg lifetime tau to the two thirds power, okay? That's the scaling for that gate. 
Well, and then you can ask, well, how did B and tau scale with the atomic state? Well, B for say rubidium and cesium scales is n to the 12th. The lifetime scales roughly is n cubed. So the error should scale as one over n to the 10th. So if you think about it that way, you say, well, I'm just gonna to go to very, very, very high n and the error will go to zero, I'll have a great gate. So life is not that friendly, that's not accurate. And the trouble is, is this is not a real atom, right? There's more levels up there. There's all these other levels. And so if I go very fast to reduce the time spent in the Rydberg state, and put the atoms close, so I have a big interaction, that's fine. But if I go fast, I'm gonna to couple to other Rydberg levels and it's not gonna work correctly. So the blockade strength I can get is actually the minimum of the spacing between neighboring levels and also the, the uh, qubit hyperfine frequency. You know, if I go, if I go, um, if that blockade interaction is too large, I might make the other ground state, which was dark, become resonant. So asymptotically, B times tau is actually constant. So to find what the best levels are, you need to actually include the quantum defects and calculate real numbers for real atoms. And, and we did that in this paper here. And what we find is that for real atoms in a real temp room temperature environment, the optimum is gonna be somewhere around N equals 100 and you can't do better than about three nines for this particular protocol. Since then, other protocols have been developed that let you get beyond three nines, but, but this blockade approach seems to be limited to three nines. Now, since that original protocol was proposed, there's been a lot of work and there's, as I said, many different ideas out there but let me just mention a couple of them, which I think are illustrative of some of the physics here. And so I'll just mention the drag gate, that's gate, Pitchler gate, and the single pulse gate. So this drag gate is a way of getting around this problem of not being able to go fast because you excite other levels by shaping the pulses. This is still a pi two pi pi gate, but we're not gonna use constant amplitude pulses. We're gonna use shape pulses that have been designed in a way such that you don't couple to these other neighboring levels, that you sort of put, put um, minima in the spectrum of the pulse, not to couple to those other levels. This was actually, this is a collaboration with uh, Frank Wilhelm, and the idea really came out of um, work he'd already done for superconducting qubits. DRAG stands for derivative reduction by adiabatic gate. And so, um, you know, that's sort of illustrated in some more detail here. Uh, the real details are in this paper, but by shaping the, the uh, pulses appropriately, one can go fast without coupling to these other Rydberg levels and thereby in principle, get a gate with higher fidelity. So, so full master equation simulations of this gate for a real atom show that in principle, you could get to four nines of fidelity with a 50 nanosecond gate time. No one has done that in the lab yet, but you know, in principle, you could get a really good gate here that's really fast, as fast as superconductors almost. So that's interesting. And if you went to a 4K cryostat where you have longer Rydberg lifetimes, you could get five nines. Uh, furthermore, the short gate time also reduces sensitivity to Doppler defacing. So that gate has not been done in the lab, but it, it's interesting, it could be useful. Uh, the sort of what's really been working well of late is what I call the Pitchler gate, uh, which was introduced in this uh, paper from the Lucan group a couple years ago. And this gate um, works very well and also has sort of a technical advantage. So this blockade gate where you're doing pi, two pi, pi, either you need two laser sources, one going to that atom, one going to that atom, or you need to move the beam very rapidly. And being able to move the beam very rapidly, it's just a pain and it's difficult to do it without getting additional errors and so on. And so this gate sends the same laser light on both atoms. So it's a symmetric gate. And that makes sense because if you write down the circuit diagram for a controlled phase gate or a CZ gate, it's symmetric in the two atoms. So the control ought to be able to be symmetric also. 
And so this gate is uh, two pulses uh, separated in time, but both applied to both atoms with a phase shift between the two pulses. And the idea is the following. If I think about the one atom subspace, that is one of the two atoms coupled to the Rydberg state, so the zero one or the one zero state, the first pulse takes me up and leaves me in a superposition of ground Rydberg, and then the second pulse with a phase shift brings me back down. Okay, so I, I start and end the gate with my population in the ground state, which is what I want. The two atom subspace, where both atoms are Rydberg coupled, and we're in the blockade limit, then I get this root two speed up, right? So I have a root two higher Rabi frequency, and the gate is arranged just that with the root two higher Rabi frequency, I'm detuned, but I'm faster. I go up and come back to the ground state. And then this phase shift doesn't make any difference because I'm in the ground state, and then I go up and come back again. So I also start and end in the ground state. And by choosing the ratio of detuning to Rabi frequency correctly, one gets the correct phases such that one has a maximally entangling gate. So it becomes equivalent to a controlled C gate. Okay, so, so very nice protocol and has been shown to work with high fidelity. Um, just recently, there's been some sort of um, variance on this gate. So this is two pulses with a discontinuous phase again. This is not as bad as spatially switching the beams but no one likes to do things discontinuously. It's sort of hard on the control system. So here's some uh, so far theory work from the folks in Stuttgart and Peter Buchler and company, where they've sort of uh, prepared a continuous version of this gate, where there's a time varying Rabi frequency and a time varying detuning. And they've designed the shapes of those pulses in such a way that you still get this behavior where both the one atom coupled and the two atom Rydberg coupled states end up in the ground state with the right phases, but you don't have anything discontinuous. You just have a continuous variation that also works well. And then really kind of the same thing out of uh, Guido Pupillo's group also looked at this kind of continuous version of this pitch loop gate and tried to optimize on the time, on the duration of the gate and showed that going to this continuous variation, you could shorten the gate by about 10% or so. so. So these two things have not been implemented yet, but they probably will be in, in not too long. So, so there's been design work around that. Another type of gate that's also been implemented is um, a single pulse adiabatic gate. And I really like this gate because I think it's the maximally simple entangling gate protocol. This Ritter gate is again the same pulse applied to both atoms, and it's a very simple thing. It's a Gaussian shaped pulse at constant detuning. And its uh, parameters are chosen such that one is in the adiabatic regime. And kind of remarkably, that will take both the one Ritter state, one atom coupled to Ritter, and two atoms coupled to Ritter states up and back down where you start and end with all the population in the ground state. And this gate was um, discovered or invented independently by a group in Wuhan, uh, Yuan Sun, my former postdoc, and also by Trent Graham and my group at about the same time independently of each other. We used a Gaussian pulse. Uh, Yuan used a, a different pulse shape, also smooth, but chose not to use Gaussian, but they're essentially the same gate. And this gate can have very high fidelity. It's very robust. These are contours of the gate fidelity uh, for variations in the detuning and variations in the pulse duration. So you can do better than two nines with 5% control parameter variations. And uh, in this paper with Francis Robichaud, we did a really detailed analysis of the sensitivity to motional effects. So not just Doppler, but the fact that when an atom is excited from the ground state to the Rydberg state, it gets a photon recoil. So if you quantize the center of mass motion of the atom, you need to take account of those photon recoils to understand the actual fidelity of the gate. And the ability to create entanglement involves having a superposition of the atom in the ground state and the Rydberg state. And so the part of the wave functions in the Rydberg state received a recoil 
And so it moves, it spatially separates from the part of the wave function of the state and the ground state. And then you recombine, and if they spatially separated too much, uh, you're going to have a loss of coherence. You're going to get some infidelity. And so we, we accounted for that with a full quantum model in this paper. And so we're able to, to calculate the potential fidelity of the gate as a function of the temperature of the atoms in the track. Uh, again, details are in the paper, but here we're seeing uh, for a few microkelvin temperature, we can get down to a few times 10 to the minus three gate error. And if we have a longer Rydberg lifetime, we can get a lower gate error. Okay. So those are all theory. And I'll just mention um, a very recent experiment out of Kenji Omori's group in Japan, where they showed actually extremely fast Rydberg interactions. So they had were able to observe energy exchange between two single Rydberg atoms on a nanosecond time scale. So this is in an, an array of atoms, and it's a little bit hard to see, but this is an array of pairs of atoms where they could vary the spacing of the, the pairs of atoms. And on a um, few nanosecond time scale, about six nanoseconds, able to observe um, uh, energy coupling and phase shifts between these atoms. They haven't quite got to the point of getting a fidelity number and demonstrating entanglement, but this has the perspective of being able to do Ripper gates on not just 50 nanosecond, but sub 10 nanosecond time scales, which would be quite interesting. So, so work in progress. What's the current state of the art for Ripper entanglement experiments? So these are the four high fidelity results of recent years. And there's work from my group at Wisconsin, also part of a collaboration with Cold Quanta, the Harvard group, the group in Wuhan, and uh, work with Strontium at Caltech. And these four experiments use different parameters, some different atoms, and also different gate protocols. So this pitchler gate was shown by the Harvard group to get them a spam corrected fidelity of 0.97 using Rydberg atoms, uh, two photon excitation, and relatively large beams, uh, 20 and 35 micron beam waste where they're illuminating both atoms with this big beam. Our most recent work with cesium using also the Pitchler protocol, um, but using small beams uh, focused on the atoms individually, so three micron waste beams has um, just slightly lower fidelity in, in our latest unpublished work. Uh, this uh, single pulse gate has been implemented by the Wuhan group uh, using moderate size beams. This was rubidium, sort of seven to eight micron waste beams. And um, they also got uh, actually 0.98 spam corrected fidelity. And then there's also been entanglement results, but not a full gate protocol using ground to Rydberg qubit, which is short-lived uh, in strontium, where they're able to pass 0.99. So this is the current state of the art uh, experimentally with these Rydberg gates. Uh, it's not at the level of fidelity that we, um, has become well-established with superconductors and trapped ions. And so this is, you know, this is about 30 times worse than the best results for, for trapped ions, but, um, I think things will continue to improve. And one of the challenges is just the, the optical excitation with focused beam. So, okay, this is our, our latest result, just to show we can do a, what looks like a good um, bell state. But let's see what happened to that. Oh, okay, it's coming up later. Okay, so that's sort of the state of the art. And now people are starting to use this to make small quantum computers using Rydberg gates. Let's see, we end at quarter past 12, is that right? Yeah, okay, okay. So in the, in the last half hour here, let me talk about quantum computing and circuits with, um, with Rydberg atoms. We end at 12. Yeah, quarter past 12, uh, or 12. 12. 12, okay, great. So there's really five platforms that are getting most of the attention these days for quantum computing. And they've all had a timeline. It's maybe kind of fun to look at. You know, the first two qubit gate uh, was done with trapped ions in 95 and the first circuits, multi-qubit, multi-gates was 2003. 
for uh, optical or photonic, the first gate was O2 and the first circuit's O5. For superconductors, O3 and O9. Quantum dots, uh, first gates was in O5, first entanglement was in O5. It took a long time to get to running circuits, two qubit circuits, Just a lot of work. And neutrals also had a long timeline. The first Ritberg entanglement experiments were 2010, and it wasn't until this year that uh, results were published showing actual circuit operations. There's, that's maybe a, a story uh, to be told over a beer as to why it took so long, but it, it has taken a long time. Okay, and so this year there were two very complementary papers showing the first digital quantum circuits and neutral atom qubits, uh, the work out of the Harvard-MIT collaboration and our work in Wisconsin, and very complementary architectures. So what they did at Harvard uh, was they had stationary control beams and they moved the atoms around. So they used these large beams to sort of set up entanglement zones where they could perform um, entangling gates in parallel on multiple pairs of atoms and then they moved the atoms in and out of those zones to uh, create the entanglement and then complete their circuit. And what they actually used it for was preparing different logical um, uh, qubits, uh, different logical code words. So they prepared uh, logical states for the Steen code, the surface code, and the toric code. So really, really nice work. And what we did was we had moving control beams and stationary atoms. So we didn't invoke any atom motion in the circuit part of the computer. We used atom motion to populate the array using rearrangement. But having done that, we kept the atom stationary and scanned our control beams around using acoustic optic deflectors. And uh, we used uh, our device to demonstrate algorithms, Niskira algorithms. Uh, one comment about this architecture so we, we use the pitchler gate where you illuminate both atoms at the same time. And we're using acousto-optic deflectors to point the laser beam to different atoms. When you deflect a beam with an acousto-optic deflector, you get a frequency shift. So you might think, well, there's a problem there. How do I get the same frequency on both atoms? Um, so we, you put two tones into the acousto-optic deflector and you get two spots and you can illuminate both atoms, but the frequency shifted. But the Rydberg excitation is two photon. There's a blue photon and an infrared photon. And if you make the sign of the shift equal and opposite on the two wavelengths, then you can be resonant on both atoms at the same time. So that, that's how we did that. And that led us to simultaneous addressing if both atoms were in the same row or the same column. Okay. So let me then talk about um, what we've been doing on this thing. So I have 20 minutes, so I'll go relatively fast. So you can sort of divide the operation into two groups of steps. There's the mechanical part, which is you do cooling, you do stochastic loading, and then you rearrange to fill your array. And then there's the, the calculation part where you control the quantum state, you initialize, you do your circuit, you measure the results, and then you can cycle around here. And then eventually you have to, to recool and reload. There's uh, my lab in Wisconsin usual complicated atomic lab, the computer's back here. It's a close in, big mess of optics. And somewhere in the center here, there's a, there's a vacuum cell. So this is uh, one of these cold quanta cells, really, really nice vacuum technology and a little hard to see, but there's an electrode structure here. And we put uh, very low noise voltages on those electrodes to control the local electric field so that we don't get additional Rydberg shifts from the Rydberg polarizability. Okay, so that's the geometry again. Let me move on. Our, our gate set is we have microwaves that just couple the two hyperfine states. It gives us global rotations. We can combine the microwaves with a focused star shifting laser beam to get uh, rotations on single atoms. And then we have the Rydberg gate for the controlled phase gate, which together with local rotations gives us a C-naught gate. Um, it's also possible to, to uh, implement multi-qubit gates with the Rydberg interaction. The Harvard group demonstrated the Foley gate. And there's been a lot of theory work, including from Alexei Gorshkov, uh, part of this center, uh, and, and many others, 
showing that you can, in principle, do very high fidelity multi-cubic gates beyond it to Foley, but up to four, five, six, what have you. And I think we'll also see that demonstrated in, in the near future. Here's some uh, microwave data. This is old data with, um, from 2015, where we had uh, two to four nines of fidelity, depending how you wanted to think about it, from randomized benchmarking. We've recently put in a bigger microwave amplifier so we can go faster. And um, we're getting um, average RB numbers, so the microwave gates close to four nines, and our typical spam error is about 3% across the array. Uh, the single qubit gates are a combination of an RZ from a focused star shifting laser beam that gives a phase shift between the qubit states combined with microwaves. So if I sandwich that pulse between a pi by two and a minus pi by two microwave, should be a minus there, then on any site where I don't have a local addressing beam, those the pi by two and minus pi by two cancel out. And when I do have a local um, Z rotation that converts the sequence into an RX or an RY gate or anything in between. And so you can do site selected rotations. Uh, and so we've been doing that. Also RB on that is a little bit worse because of the local addressing, but we get about two nines of fidelity. And uh, because of the time it takes to do the very careful alignment, we only use uh, six sites, although in principle we could have used more. One of the challenges of this optical addressing with small beams is just the optical addressing with small beams. It's keeping tightly focused laser beams well aligned to individual sites in the lattice. And this is a technical thing, but an important one, I think. And so I just want to show you, here's a simulated um, RZ error uh, that where I'm just taking account of the radial misalignment of a tightly focused Gaussian beam addressing a single atom and I'm accounting for atom motion in the trap at a, a temperature of five microkelvin. And as I go from uh, a laser beam waste to two microns up to five microns, the pi pulse error gets smaller, but sort of the three micron size we used in the experiments, we have to be aligned to 100 nanometers to, to maintain the, um, this dash line as the actual gate error that we observed. So it means that we have to keep our alignment good to 100 nanometers over time. And um, there's sort of long-term drifts that can happen. There's also just beam position jitter. This is data taken over a whole day showing about 20 nanometer uh, jitter in the beam position. And that's sort of a feature or a, a defect of using Gaussian beams. In principle, if we shape the beams to top hat shapes, we can greatly reduce that sensitivity and you can see that here. Here's the sensitivity to alignment with a Gaussian beam. Here's the sensitivity to alignment with a super Gaussian with a row to the six um, beam profile. And even with a very small beam, we can keep the pulse error very low. So one of the things we're actively working on is how to scan super Gaussian beams around rapidly and, and use that kind of beam. And this gets into the optical scanning technology which uh, I can talk about offline, but um, that's sort of one of the open challenges for this small beam approach. Okay, so with that, I'll just mention a couple uh, demonstrations we did. Uh, we prepared GHG states using the standard circuit. Um, so this was with up to six atoms. So here you see the parity curves from two up to six atoms. The frequency goes up as it's supposed to. Here's the fidelity of those results. We were crossing the entanglement um, threshold. Uh, we were above the threshold at six, and if we'd gone to more atoms, we, we would have crossed the threshold around eight. And we also looked at the coherence time of these GHC states, and it fit pretty well to a one over N curve, which corresponds to collective uh, non-Markovian noise, which would be due to the magnetic field and the laser intensity. We recently put in some better coil drivers and have reduced our magnetic noise by more than an order of magnitude. So uh, next time we look at this, we should be able to do better, but we'll, we'll see. So we've made GHG states. And then we looked at a couple of basic algorithms. You know, phase estimation is one of the most important quantum algorithms. It's fundamental to quantum chemistry and also to factoring, where one has a uh, unitary operator, one wants to extract the 
the uh, energy or phase off, and that's done by uh, controllably uh, acting with that operator with uh, qubits that form a register, which will encode the phase. Then we take a, a QFT, quantum Fourier transform, to map a phase distribution onto a population that we can then observe. Uh, this just shows that if we use a two qubits for the phase register, we can directly observe the phases corresponding to these four operators uniformly distributed around two pi, so it, it works. And then we, we took on a kind of standard test, which is the, the uh, energy of a hydrogen molecule. And I have to say, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a quantum chemist. And so I was just amazed by the amount of infrastructure that goes into mapping even this very simple problem onto a quantum circuit. So you, you start with a second quantized uh, Hamiltonian for the hydrogen molecule in a particular uh, basis. Uh, that can be mapped onto a two qubit Hamiltonian. Uh, we use the method uh, in this paper here. And then using uh, symmetry, you can actually map this onto a one qubit problem, uh, this uh, so called tapered Hamiltonian. And then we implemented that with one qubit uh, for the uh, operator and then three qubits for the phase representation and started with the what corresponds to the hartree fock brown state for this problem, which is just putting this last qubit in the state one. So then the circuit for that turns out to be uh, 14 two qubit gates and almost 61 qubit gates. So we use four qubits. Here's the state qubit, here's the measurement qubits. And uh, although not perfect with this many gates, our, our gate errors were uh, accumulating we were able to get a well-resolved ground state energy, which was actually not far from what it's supposed to be. And then finally, we looked at the max step problem, which is another favorite for NISC era demonstrations. And we ran this again on four qubits, uh, where the central qubit was connected to the other three and the max cut solution as the central qubit in the different state than the other three. So there's three states, uh, two states that do that in the computational basis. And the way we label things, it was this state and this state. The dark blue is the experimental results. The um, light blue is theory. So this is for P equals one, one round of QAOA with this cost function and a mixing operator, two rounds and three rounds. And you see we get better results after two rounds with the improved approximation ratio. And then at three rounds, and if things were perfect, uh, we'd get the um, desired solution every time. In practice, we did a little bit worse again because our gate errors were accumulating. But this was already um, 18 CT gates deep. So this is not state of the art for quantum simulation, but it's the first time with um, neutral atom qubits and ripper gates, so we were pretty happy about it. And you know, I'll just say, you know, is there a quantum advantage to doing this kind of thing? Here's uh, just an advertisement for a paper we put up in the archive uh, this summer, where we looked at QAOA applied uh, to max cut for three regular graphs. Three regular graphs being graphs where each node is connected to three other nodes, and asked the question: Would a well-functioning quantum computer uh, beat uh, heuristic classical solvers, which are remarkably good. And these heuristic solvers indeed provide high quality solutions rapidly on large graphs. And we did really extensive numerics and showed that to reach quantum advantage in terms of execution time would require noiseless execution of circuits with depth P greater than 11. And so I have to say it appears unlikely for that particular problem that you're going to get a quantum advantage without error correction. There may be other graph problems and other versions or implementations of MaxCut on with different uh, connectivity graphs where you do get quantum advantage. But what we could show is that for that particular case of three regular graphs, it's unlikely uh, to be found, which was kind of a negative result, but not totally unexpected. So what's the outlook? You know, the full potential of quantum computing is going to require error correction for fault tolerance. And as we know, error correction is very resource demanding. 
depending on the coherence you have available, the fidelity of gate operations, fidelity of measurements, you know, a fault tolerant qubit might require 100 or 1,000 physical qubits. So a machine with 100 logical qubits that could solve some grand challenge problems is going to be a really big number of physical qubits. So I would say a minimal set of requirements is a lot of qubits, high fidelity gates, and then mid-circuit measurements to do error correction. And let me just take the last five minutes here and just uh, say a few things about getting towards all those things. So more qubits. So we, we did a fun experiment in my group lately where we made a really big array with a very simple optics. And I, I like this when we can do difficult things in a, in a simple way. So this is a way to make large arrays of red tweezer beams and also large arrays of blue bottle traps. And the idea is the following. There's a bit of optics. Supposing I take a plane wave and I send it through a circular aperture and then I Fourier transform it with the lens. In this Fourier plane, I get an airy disk path, which is a central lobe and a bunch of rings, as you learned about in your undergraduate optics or ENM class. If I then uh, put an aperture in that Fourier plane and only transmit the central lobe of the airy pattern and then transform again, what I get is very close to a Gaussian beam. It turns out to be a Gaussian beam plus some very small extra lobes. I can do the same thing where instead of having a transmitting aperture here, I have a blocking aperture. That is, I transmit all the light except I block it in this disk here. And then I do the same thing and filter the airy pattern. I get a dark spot on a uniform background, which makes a bottle beam trap in 3D. So if you do that with an array of apertures, not just one, you get an array of spots. So it's really simple. There's no active device. There's no spatial light modulator. There's just a fabricated component and some simple optics. And I get a big array of spots. And we trapped uh, 1,225 atoms. This is an average picture, not rearrangement. But we trapped up to seven or 800 at one time. So we can make these really big arrays. And we, we think we can scale this to, to several thousands. So we think we're on a path to having uh, large arrays, which is great. What about the gate fidelity outlook? Well, this is, um, I showed you what the state of the art is. These numbers are just the gate fidelity from my group in Wisconsin over time. We keep banging away at this. What I will say is that there's not a lot of data here, but there's sort of two slopes. Uh, there's this first slope here. And then more recently, we started working with cold quanta and getting professional engineering help on the optical mechanics, on the software system. And I'll just say that's accelerated progress. And I'm, I'm a strong believer in academic commercial collaborations because if you want to not just do science but build a quantum computer, that's a lot of engineering to be done, more than you're going to do in a university lab. I kind of sound like Chris Monroe now, but um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's accelerated us and who can predict the future, but we think we're on a path to getting to high fidelity and we'll see how long that takes. The other thing I'll say is this field has expanded. There's a lot of groups now doing these tweezer arrays and rubric states and just the fact that there's more people on it is going to naturally, I think, progress the field faster. 